Jude, while y'all are turning there. Galatians 2, verse 20 says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. We know that verse, that I'm crucified with Christ, yet I live. And he says, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Okay, we know that we were buried and dead in trespasses and sin. We were raised in newness of life with Christ. If you were saved, when he got up out of the grave, that's when you had victory. Because he could have died on the cross, but unless he rose victorious over death, hell, and the grave, we would have had no victory. So, that verse goes on to say, And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. He says, I accomplished that task of first being crucified to the flesh and allowing Christ to live in me first by faith in the Son of God. And it says, who, referring to Jesus, who loved me and gave himself for me. Verse number 21 says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. In other words, he and he being the Apostle Paul who wrote Galatians, is recounting the time that he went back to Jerusalem and he had to confront Peter face to face. Tell Peter, hey, this whole doctrine of circumcision, that you got to be circumcised to be saved, he said, it's hogwash. It doesn't make any sense. He says, if we want to live by the law, we're dead because we can't keep the whole law. And he says, you know, he was stood into the face and he taught everyone at Jerusalem he says, you were born a Jew, but you don't expect the Gentiles to keep the law. He says, so why do you expect them after they get saved all of a sudden to have to keep the law? He says, the law does not save us. That's what made us dead. In the beginning, there was just one law. Don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Man couldn't even keep that one. You expect me to think that we can keep all 600 of the laws that God gave it? No. So he says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. He says, grace set us free. He says, I don't keep the law because I'm afraid of God's judgment. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep his commandments. He says, I live by faith of the Son of God. I love him, therefore I believe what he says. In fact, before you loved him, before you ever knew how much he loved you, you had to believe that what he said was true in order to get saved. Before you really fell in love with God, you had to believe what he said. So how much more after you get saved? He says in verse number 21, For if righteousness cometh by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. In other words, if you could save yourself through works, why would Jesus come? Okay, but... I was meditating on that verse. God brought that verse up in my memory. Well, verse number 20 back over this week. I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, well, in Acts, they were first called Christians at Antioch. Okay, before that, they were called disciples. And then some of the disciples, 11 of them, were then called apostles. And then you had one named Saul who got in and on the road to Damascus. He becomes a missionary to the Gentiles. Long down the way, he gets to us. Right? Well, they were called disciples by Jesus. They were called Christians by the world. Then a few of them were called apostles. And them apostles mostly wrote your New Testament. Okay, well, there was Peter. Then there was Peter the apostle. They had two different people. You say, how? He grew. He died crucified to the flesh and allowed Christ to live in him. There was Saul, and then there was Paul. Right? Saul died on the road to Damascus, and Paul started living. God changed his name to show the change that had happened in his heart. Yeah, I mean, we can look at others. We know that John was always the disciple whom Jesus loved. Well, how did he know that? Because John wrote that. He said, I know God loves me. That's why he wrote the disciple whom Jesus loved. He says, if nobody else could say it, I know he loved me. But then we also read in the book of John that for God so loved the world 
So if John was the disciple whom he loved today, you're the Christian that he loved. Right? He made it personal. And that personal love that he had propelled his faith for the rest of his life. That even when he's banished in the next book over from where we're going to be reading today to the Isle of Patmos, right? Verse number one, right? The revelation of Jesus Christ, which Jesus gave unto him to show him unto the servants, right? Well, what was he doing when he received this great revelation? The Bible says he was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. The love that John had was so strong. He, even separa he was separated from everybody else because he loved Jesus. They, tried, they were like, we can't, we're tired of this guy preaching. We we'll just, just send him off to an island somewhere where he's by himself. Well, he's still having himself a time out there. He's saying, even though there's nobody around for me to blow my testimony. Right? He shifted focus. On, it's not about me. Keep in mind, he'd been in boats that were about ready to sink. But yet Jesus come up and say, peace be still. Amen. He was there when Jesus walked across water in the middle of a storm, and they all thought that it was a ghost. Right? He was there when the men tore the roof off of the house and lowered a man down. They had the palsy on the bed. And then Jesus said, take up thy bed and walk. And he walked out of there. He was there the day that Jesus said, okay, I'm going to break these fish and bread, and you guys are going to serve the thousands. Well, John was one of the ones that gets, kept taking plate after plate. And he knew how much he started off with. After about plate two, Jesus is thinking, this is more than he had at the beginning. I could have swore he gave me every last bit when he gave me the first plate. Now I'm on plate two. Well, imagine by the time they got to plate 5,000, plus the women and children. That he saw it all. But Judas saw it all, and he didn't believe. Didn't love him, he sold him for 30 pieces of silver. Right, so what's the difference between Christians that make a difference and Christians that don't make a difference? They remove the I from Christianity. They get themselves out of the way. They die and Christ lives. You really think that Peter was such a good preacher that he could get up and thousands of people would get saved? No. He's just an old fisherman. He's somebody that knew enough about God to know when Jesus walked by and was smart enough to hitch his trailer to his cart or hitch his cart to that horse. He said, I want to be yoked with Jesus. Jesus said, follow me. And he said, okay. What makes Peter different than you and me? Nothing. He was a sinner. Lived in the flesh. I mean, he had to write down part of the Bible. They got to see Jesus. But Jesus said that he must go because the Comforter must come. He said it was better for the Comforter to come and abide with men. Amen. I've got everything that Peter had and more. Peter died before some of this book was even completed. I've gotten to read things that Peter didn't get to read. Right? Paul wrote about half of the New Testament, but there were things that Paul didn't get to see. Paul, I mean, he may have seen it. There was a time that he said he was caught up in the flesh, and whether he was alive or dead, he didn't know. But he did know that God showed him some things. And he didn't even talk about what God showed him because it scared him so much. He said, I've been so afraid to even mention it that I haven't told anybody this for a while. You say, what do you see? I don't know, but we didn't need to see it. Maybe he got to see the book of Revelation before it was written. I don't know. But maybe God didn't tell him, hey, write this down. Because that's what he told John. He said, John did the seven churches. He says, hey, I'm writing a letter to y'all. Not from me, but from God. He said, what made all them different? What in their flesh? Didn't that they, wasn't that they had more faith? That God gave them an extra dose of faith? One that they got more grace. God's no respecter of persons. So what made them different? They got themselves out of their Christianity. Well, what are you saying, Brother Jordan? Well, I'm saying, Christianity is not about you. They were called Christians because they lived a life that looked like Christ. They said, we don't want to be like us. I know where I came from. I want to be like Christ. They didn't call themselves Christians. Others said, you look so much like Christ, we're going to call you Christians. You live like He taught. You loved Him so much you kept His commandments. Well, if we want to get the I 
out of Christianity. Uh, we're probably not going to finish this all day, but we won't get the eye out of Christianity. We get to Jude. Again, verse number 20. But ye, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith. What's that mean? Live by faith. Make your faith stronger. Well, how do you do that? You get in here. You find the concrete assurances of God in your life that He will do what He said that He would do. And then you live by faith, and He rewards faith and obedience, and that little bit of reward increases your faith. Well, Lord, I need something to help me get through the rest of this day. He gives you a verse. Your faith should be stronger. Right? We should be more apt to turn to God for the answer next time than less. But how many times do we come in and God will send a preacher or a message, at Sunday school, whatever it is, but it's exactly what we want and we walk out and instead of saying, Lord, I should have asked you all along, we go back to looking for answers in the world. He says, building yourselves up on your most holy. Edify yourselves unto growth. Right? Don't just be satisfied with this plateau. Get to the next plateau and the next plateau. Lord, get rid of me. Put in more of you. That's what he's saying. Build yourself up on faith. You know what faith means? Faith means, Lord, doesn't make sense. World thinks I'm crazy. Family might think I'm crazy. This may not make sense to anybody else, but I just believe that it's what you want me to do. If the disciples had faith, they wouldn't have been so worried in that storm because Jesus says, I'll meet you on the other side. They were coming through the storm whether he stopped it or not. But they lost faith. They got their eyes on the storm. Peter walked on water for a little bit. They walked so close that Jesus was able to reach out and get them. But when he looked at the storm, his faith began to wane. He began to sink. Don't go out and walk on water and try and walk on your pool water. It's not going to go too well. Right? But Jesus, Peter said, If it be you, bid me come. Jesus said, It's me. And he said, I believe him. See, boys. He still believed it was Jesus, but when he saw the storm, he didn't think, he thought maybe Jesus is bigger than the water. He's walking on the water. But he wasn't walking on the storm. So Peter saw the storm and he said, well, how are we going to walk out of this? Began to sink. Build yourself up on faith. Okay, but then he goes on to say, not just faith, your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God. Well, he says, first, build up your faith. Second, keep yourself in the love of God. But God already loves me. That's not what this is talking about. He loved you with an everlasting love. There was never a moment where you weren't loved by God. But, doesn't mean that we're always in the position to receive the love of God. Obedience brings blessing. Disobedience brings punishment, judgment, the wrath of God. In His mercy, He doesn't pull out, pour out the full wrath of God, but chastisement, correction. When He says, keep yourself in the love of God, first He means keep yourself in the position to receive the love of God. But second, keep the love of God in you. Keep yourself in the love that... You know, we, two weeks ago, we taught on. Love is not about... Receiving, it's not love isn't about you it's about what you want to do for somebody else because of how much you care love is sacrifice love is giving up things not to show how much you care but because you want to do you're willing to give other things up because you love someone you don't want them to suffer through it so you're willing to take part of that suffering or all of that suffering so he's saying keep the love that Christ had for you in you don't let it die out you want to know what the light that Christ shone? Truth. And how was truth delivered? Through love. So if we want to shine as a light, we got to take the truth of what Jesus did for us. But how do we shine it? Through love. He said, keep yourself in the love of God. Then he says, 
verse number 22 and of some have compassion making a difference well there's another word compassion what does compassion mean we think we know what the word compassion means but what does the word compassion mean well I'll tell you because I looked it up on Webster's 1828 dictionary compassion means a suffering with another it means painful sympathy the sensation of sorrow excited by the distress or misfortunes of another commiseration it's a mixed passion compounded of love and sorrow it says extreme distress of an enemy even changes enmity into at least temporary affection compassion has a twofold definition first one in hillbilly talk you love somebody so much that when hardship comes into their life when they start suffering your passion for them compels you to intervene I love them so much I'm not going to let them suffer that's the first compassion your love causes you to act but then it also said that even in times of war where you have enemies it says even extreme suffering will for at least a moment cause you to temporarily have affection for the person that you just hated a minute ago the second form of compassion is I don't know you you may be my enemy you could be the very thing that stands in my way of wanting to do what God wants me to do but once I notice your immense pain and suffering I don't care the fact that you used to hate me you may still hate me but the hate that I have has been replaced with love because I see how much pain you are in you see such misery that it causes you to forget what you thought about them and now you care about getting them out of that situation you know how many times I was going to write them all down but there's too many and we'd have been here just reading examples but Jesus when he saw the multitude that had been following him for three days and they didn't have food the Bible says he had compassion on them the woman at the well Jesus had compassion on her the madman at Gadara when he asked Christ to be one of his disciples to go with him Christ said he had compassion on him and said you can't go with me but go back and tell people what's been done in your heart how your life has been changed well let's break down those three examples those people that were following after Jesus that multitude well first he loved them because he let them follow him he could have, how many times did Jesus just say hey we're sneaking out of the crowd and they're not going to see us and they didn't see him every time he came into a new city there was a new multitude that's because he sent them 70 disciples out two by two to pave the way to say the Lord is coming Christ is headed to your city but when he left there's a lot of times people didn't know where he was headed it wasn't the same multitude but this multitude said we love him we want to hear what he has to say we care so much about hearing what he has for us that they followed him three days into the desert he went across on a boat and they beat him there they were waiting on him on the other side and he was moved with compassion he saw that they were hungry not physically spiritually he came to show them introduce them to the chief shepherd the great shepherd because God's sheep had no leader they were wandering in the wilderness and he came to save that which was lost his compassion was I see how hungry you are for a leader for somebody that's going to guide you he's already thinking in terms of after he's resurrected and the Holy Ghost has come he says I'll live in you through the Holy Spirit and guide you daily and if he cared about their soul that much of course he cared about their physical hunger they didn't take thought 
for their own life. Or maybe they did, but even when provisions rain out, they said, I want God more than I want to turn around for food. And he saw that hunger that they had for the things of God, and he said, I have compassion on them. I will take away their suffering physically because I love them. But before he fed them, you know what he did? He sat in a boat and he taught them. In fact, one of the greatest messages probably ever preached, Sermon on the Mount. It only took us about eight years to get through it when we taught on it in Sunday school. Why? Every word, every verse, you can model your life after it, you'll be a better Christian. But you know what the Sermon on the Mount was about? You need to stop being a sheep in the wilderness. You need to be God's sheep. Get rid of you. Put God in you. Compassion is the fruit of love. By the first definition, you love someone so much, you have compassion. True love is active. It's not passive. True love causes you to act. God so loved the world, He sent His only begotten Son. God wouldn't have loved us if He didn't send His, or if He wouldn't have sent His Son. True love causes you to move. Well, that act is called compassion. Your love causes you to want to intervene in someone else's problems. You may intervene outwardly. You love someone so much that you want their whatever's going on in their life to stop and God says I want you to be the vessel by which it's going to be stopped it might be a meal here it might be a gift there it might be hey I just want to take you out to lunch I want to be your friend you realize that when Paul came back to Jerusalem after leaving his Saul going to persecute and kill Christians he comes back Barnabas looked at him and said I have compassion on him Nobody else wanted to be associated with him. But Barnabas said, I want to be his friend. His love for Christ compelled him to put himself on the shelf and say, Lord, I want to show that man the love of God. I want to show him the love that you've shown me. And he became his friend. Sometimes it's that easy. Other times you may have compassion that compels you instead of getting a extra hour of sleep tonight I'm going to spend extra time praying for this person because I know they've got a problem in their life they're suffering and I want God to move on their behalf I can't do it but I love them enough that I want to intercede intercessory prayer when you just say Lord I want to pray not about me I want to lift up one of your saints because I know that they're going through it maybe I've been through it and Lord you brought me through it so I know you can bring them through it or Lord I haven't been through I can't even imagine what they're going I don't know what to pray for them but Lord I pray that you would that's compassion because you love somebody then there's compassion because somebody's in so much pain there's compassion on those that are condemned God so loved the world why? Well, first, He loved us because we were made in His image. He desired us to be companions with Him. And that was lost. And now we were suffering in sin, in the shackles of death, because the wages of sin is death. Your first breath that you ever took, from the first heartbeat that ever happened inside of your mother's womb, that started a clock that said, well, He's alive but it'll also be dead. It was written. If you're born, you die in sin. Can't avoid it. And God looked at that pain and that suffering and the turmoil that would be in our life and that pain and suffering moved the heart of God. We were His enemy. We were at enmity with God. That means we were arrayed against our very life being born in sin or conceived in sin born in sin and then living in sin was an affront to God it was an insult to God it was an attack on God yet he didn't wipe us off the map why? because compassion 
causes you to look at your enemy, but because of the pain that he's in, you have affection for him. God saw us, but then he also saw the pain that we were in. And he said, I hate the sin, but I love the sinner. What we did was an attack against God, but he endured that suffering so that we could become sons of God. He said, they were born into it. They didn't choose this life, although after we came to the age of accountability, we did choose the sin. We're sinners by nature and by trade. We chose to sin. But even then, God says, I know the suffering that's coming that they don't know about. I know about hell. I know about the lake of fire where they were never intended to go. And because I don't want them to suffer, I will endure the sin. Not because he's tolerating it. No, 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 no. There's a day of judgment coming. But he says, I'll postpone judgment to give them a chance to be introduced to my son. Because I love them with an everlasting love. But you see the shape that you're in. Some of the most compassionate stories are those from you know, World War I, World War II, where they're in trenches or they're on battlefields or in forests, and the enemy may have been routed. Or there may have been a standoff where a charge happened and then nobody was winning so they pulled back. And there's men laying out in the middle of the field crying in pain. Right, The horrific shrieks of somebody that knows without help they're going to die out there in no man's land. That's why they called it that. You get out there, no man lives. But yet somebody. Usually you know the stories that we hear about it was an American soldier I was out there looking for Americans but he saw an enemy but his pain and the state that he was in caused him to forget the hate to forget all of the time maybe that guy was the one that was shooting at him he forgot all of that and he had compassion on somebody that didn't deserve it right and that guy's out. you were trying to kill me but yet he has compassion. Anybody ever see the uh, movie Hacksaw Ridge? Yeah, about the medic that, be, hey, he didn't believe right. He was a seven-day Adventist. But he did have faith. Faith enough to say, I want to fight for, I want to stand up for my country, but I'm not going to take a life. He had to pass all the basic. He went through all that. Well, when he starts lowering people down off of that mountain in the third act of that movie, Right? People are wondering, where in the world's all these bodies? He saved a handful of Japanese soldiers. Ones that would have shot him regardless of the fact that he didn't have a gun. Even though he had the big medical helmet. Most of the time they'd aim for medics because it meant that more people would die and there wouldn't be people, you know, the guys that got saved back at the hospital wouldn't have been able to come back in the war. They're aiming for medics. But yet, he saw them instead of hate instead of rage what did he have compassion they you know they're coming down the mountain he goes, where in the world is he finding Japanese guys at well, up on top of that mountain by the next day they had a conveyor belt like a little elevator thing going where they could lower them down on beds now he lowered each one of them down by hand and even when it was an enemy he didn't let the rope slip to where they fell faster he treated it just like it was one of his friends. Why? Because compassion will replace everything that you don't like and you'll see what the person needs. How do we have a love for the world? Compassion. Sometimes we just like to see what people are doing wrong. We'll look past the wrong. Look past the fact that they might be in confrontation with you they may rub you the wrong way. You may just like, get along with it. You may have never done anything to that person that you know of, but yet this, they don't like you. It is man's nature to hate the person that does the act. If you did something against me, I hate you. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. We wrestle against 
the spiritual wickedness that keeps them in chains. I look at the person that's doing wrong to me and compassion says, look past what they're doing and look at what pain they're in. Their soul's in agony because their soul cries that there is a God and they're either trying to deny it or they think that they've met Him and they haven't. You look past what they do and you see where they will be without Christ. Christianity is removing the me. It doesn't happen. I don't care what happens to me. It may be hard. Oh well. Life is hard. The cross was hard. I got a cakewalk. But why did Christ go through all that stuff? Compassion. You can love Christ all you want to, but He commanded us to have the love for the world, like we taught on two weeks ago, that He had for us. Well, how do we do that? Well, sometimes you may look at somebody and think, I'll pick on Brother Brian. Brother Brian, you may look at me and think, ah, there's nothing I like there. And I may look at you and say, man, that guy's got skulls all over his heart. I don't want nothing to do with him. But I don't see what you do, who you are. I see what will be. I don't want somebody to die and go to hell. Why would you want somebody to go through the suffering of hell that you wanted to get saved in order to avoid? Right? When people say, I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy, most of the time that's just a way for them to get out of whatever they just said they do to them. Right, or man, I wish that happened to this person. I don't want to seem like a bad person, so I'll say, I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. Well, then why would you wish hell on somebody? Why would you wish to lake a fire on somebody? Why would you wish, you know, for the chains of sin that kept us bound? I know how heavy those are. I know how painful those are. I remember what it felt like to realize I'm destined for eternal damnation. That was a heavy weight. What are people carrying that every day? I should have compassion for them. Because I know that pain. Some of them may have you know, more problems, less problems. doesn't matter. They got one problem, it's sin. And of some have compassion making a difference why? because compassion compels you to act compassion will make you do things that you didn't think you'd do first love love Christ and if you love Christ you'll love others because Christ will show you how much others need him Christ will show you that he's altogether lovely and you'll want to tell others but there are some days that you're going to run into somebody that in the flesh you don't want to have anything to do with them. Christ had people that spat on him, plucked his beard out, beat him to where he didn't even resemble a man anymore. Then he carried a cross two miles up a hill to get to Calvary. And what does he say? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. They hated him. And he saw their pain in the suffering and the worth of their soul and he said I choose to love them I choose to take suffering in order to show them affection compassion but you can love Jesus all you want to you really don't keep yourself in the love of God you really don't build yourself up on your most holy faith if you don't believe that Jesus said go why? Because he didn't want them to go to hell. And when you face someone that may hate you, that wants to kill you, that wishes that you would be wiped off the face of the earth so they didn't have to deal with you, they could be like our forefathers in the face that, that we're learning about. Or if you've read the book, The Trail of the Blood, or Fox's Book of Martyr, they went through horrendous things but went out singing, Oh, how I love Jesus. Why? Because they had compassion for those that were doing the things too. They said, no, I won't recant Jesus because He's your only hope. They said, I love you despite the fact that you hate me. Why? Because I want you to be like me. You may not realize it yet, but what I got is what you need. And even your most hated enemy 
once you see the pain that they're in, can become the person that you love most in this world. They may want to be your enemy, but you just want to be their friend. The one that introduces them to your greatest friend. But then the next verse it says, And some save with fear. Pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment, spart the garment spotted by the flesh. He's saying some people, it's going to be hard to love them, show them compassion, because they won't let you. Christ had compassion for us, but how many people don't let God show them the love of God? They reject it. They refuse it. Well, sometimes you've got to wake people up. They may not want you to intervene in their life. That's fine. But I just want to tell you about what's going to happen. Save them with fear, pulling them from the fire. Why? Well, if I can't love you, I'll hate the garment that you're wearing. It says, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Doesn't say the person, the soul, the spirit. No, the flesh. What's that saying? Hate the sin. I hate what sin has done to you, so I'm going to tell you where sin's going to take you. That may be what somebody... But why do you want to tell them? Because you love them. They may not let you intervene in their life. They may not want you to be present in their life. Well, then you just may need to be the beacon that says, hell is eternal. There's no escape. It's not a party. It's a place of everlasting damnation and suffering. But I know the one that can take it all away from you. Some, you make a difference because they let you love them. The other people, they don't want you to love them. But yet, you've just got to shine the light to them. You hate what they have become because of sin, but you love the person inside of that garment. The danger is if I let me get involved, it's real easy to start letting my opinion of somebody's life change if I become friends with them. Well, they're my friend. I don't want to offend them. You ever been there? No, no, no. Hate the garment that is spotted by the flesh. I hate the sin in their life because it keeps them from God. That's why we should hate sin in our own life because it separates us from fellowship with God. But when he says, hate the garment, I hate what your life is, but I also know what Jesus can make it into. He's saying, have compassion on the person Hate the act, but love the person that did it. They say, never forget the fact that you may love, you may have compassion for somebody. God may birth a burden in your heart for somebody else. You may look at someone and see all the pain in there, and you may want to alleviate that from them. But don't let your love for somebody blind you from the fact that they need help. Always remember that they've got a garment of flesh that's going to lead them straight to hell. But Phil, or no, wait. Well, Brother Phil sings the one song. Brother Clint sings the other. Brother Clint sings the one that says, you know, take off the old one and put on the new. What's that? That garment. I got rid of the one that was spotted by flesh. What was that? Though I was black, I came forth white as wool. He gave me a new garment that was cleansed of the spot of sin. Never forget that the people that we may love, you know what a garment is? An outward thing. If it's tainted or spotted by sin, it's evident. Don't forget that they need something. Just because you love them doesn't mean that you can love them out of hell. They have to take off the old garment and choose to accept the one that Christ has for them. Don't let your compassion be the reason that you don't tell somebody because you're worried about what they'll think or what they'll say or how they'll receive it. But that's between them and God. But I also know that it takes somebody to plant, somebody to water, 
so that the Holy Ghost can do the work in their heart. I love them enough that even though it may hurt them to hear me tell them, I hate the garment that they're wearing. And I'm going to do everything that I can as led by the Spirit. I'm not saying go out there and do it because you think it's... If God tells you to, do it. But if He doesn't, pray that God will send somebody that does. Pray that the Holy Ghost will take the seed that you may have been able to plant in their life. Pray that it will send somebody to water. Or maybe you just went and watered. But pray that God will do the work. Why? Because I know where they're headed. Well, after I told them that, they hate me. Well, they may hate you. Just because they want to be your enemy and fight. If you remember the garment that they're wearing, you'll have compassion. You'll see the pain that they're in and it'll stoke more affection. Some people, usually Christians, we love them so much that we see them go through something. We want to take that suffering because we care so much about them. What is that? That's compassion. Some, they need somebody to help bear their load. That's what the, Jesus said. Bear you one another's burden, so fulfill the law of Christ. He also said, take His yoke upon us. For it's a, really, Jesus is carrying all of our loads. But every now and then we say, Lord, I love that person so much, I want some of their load too. That's what we're saying. Lord, I want to be like you and carry somebody else's burden. Our love for Him prompts us to love others. You just can't help it if you say, you just going to love Christians. It's one of the signs of a Christian that we have a spirit that bears witness. With one In other words, God says, hey, you're one of mine and that person's one of mine too. Just easy to fellowship with them. Because they love God. You love God. Well, what do you say? That's compassion. You may love them, but you don't really love them until you have compassion. That's when you do something about it. Those people that we've all had in our lives that said, I'm there for you, I'm with you, I'll be there the extra mile with you. And when hard times come, they split, they didn't love you. Those that have compassion, they're the ones that love you. The ones that are willing to do because they love. Or in the case of an enemy, God could have wiped this off here, but He didn't. Punch. He has been long-suffering. Didn't have to. He chose to be long-suffering. He chose to have grace and mercy to postpone His judgment because... He saw the pain that our enemy or his enemy was in. And he said, I want to stop that pain instead of bringing about the end of that pain. What's that? Death and hell. God saw something that was his enemy and he really looked at what they were going through and he chose to love them and to act to stop that suffering. What great love that God's trying to save somebody that's kicking him, gnashing him, fighting him tooth and nail the whole way while he's just trying to love him. Imagine you were in charge of everything. You spoke it into existence. And the very thing that you created did the one thing you told it not to. How many of us would have said, okay, let's get a sacrifice done for it. Let's get you all clothed. Can't live in the garden anymore, but here's how you're going to till the ground. Here's how you can make a living. Here's how you can survive outside of the garden. And oh, by the way, if you just do what I tell you to do, keep those sacrifices going. Eventually, one day, the perfect sacrifice will come. How many of us would have done the extra work because we had compassion? How many of us would have looked at what somebody did and said I hate you because of what you did God hates the spotted garment but he loves the person that's inside of it wearing it how many of us would have just wiped everything off of the face of the earth and said never again how many of us would have killed Eve at the instant well nope you bit into the apple or whatever fruit it was it just said the fruit of the tree you bit it now you're dead 
No, he let Adam make the choice. Didn't kill him then either. He gave him a chance to fess up to what they did. They did. Adam took the roundabout way and said, well, the woman that you gave me gave it to me. But he said, I did eat. They had to pay the consequences. They weren't allowed to live in the Garden of Eden anymore. But yet we find that ever since, God's always had somebody somewhere telling other people about Him. Why? He hated what they were doing, but He loved who they were. Everything they did spits in the face of God. Attacks the holiness of God. Is an affront and a reminder that God created that. And it chooses to do evil. But yet, He still loves and still does because of compassion. You want to get the eye out of Christianity? Say, Lord, remove my emotions, my mindsets. Give me the love of Christ in my life. Give me the faith to live by that love. Because it's hard to live just by putting yourself out there all the time. Every time somebody rejected Jesus, he accepted that insult in the hopes that, well, I mean, he knew everything. Maybe one day one of the people that rejected him while he was here, they ran into Paul or John or somebody else that got saved. He saw the Ethiopian eunuch and he saw Philip going and talking to him, him getting saved and then getting baptized. Right, he saw you where you were sitting and he said instead of pouring out judgment because this person because if God dumped out judgment for sin it wouldn't have just been that person it had been all sin it's all or nothing and God said I'll accept the insult I'll take the suffering of being rejected and the sin that is prevalent in that person's life because even though you may have said no other people need to still hear because they'll say yes What are you saying, Brother Jordan? If you live by love, there's going to be pain. There's going to be hurt. If you show compassion, not everybody's going to receive it. But you accept that hurt because you know somebody out there needs to hear. God wants you to go to somebody else. Don't quit at all because one person said no. I look past that. You may have said no today. I didn't get saved the first time I heard the gospel. I said no that day, but there was a day that I said yes. How many times ever? I don't know. But I do know that God was willing to send somebody else. Tell me. Somebody else. Plant and water. Plant and water. Till eventually I had enough sense to believe in what I'd been taught. He didn't just stop after the first one. So why should I? It's going to hurt. You're going to get pricked. You may have a thorn in the flesh. Well, what's my thorn in the flesh? I, I'm kind of that, nope. Burn the bridge. You hurt me? No more. Jesus wasn't that way. It may be an affront to your flesh. Your pride may be hurt in the flesh. But Christ endures so much more every day. Because the wicked are still being wicked. And he hates the wickedness. He's angry with the wicked every day. Just like we're supposed to hate that garment spotted by the flesh. But even though he's angry with the wicked, he hasn't poured out judgment yet. Why? Because somebody else needs it here. Because he has compassion. When I can take the pain. I can take the pricks. I can take the load that may be. I just want to tell something, but they won't hear. That's a great weight. You just want somebody to know the truth, and they won't let you tell them. Or they won't accept it. It may break your heart, but compassion is looking at suffering and saying, I want to end it, even if that means I have to take it. That's the love that changed the world, because that's the kind of love that Christ showed to us. Why were the apostles so different? Because they loved that way. Why were the forerunners of the faith that brought the faith all the way to America and then eventually all the way to Florence, Kentucky? Why did they get the gospel as far as they did because they loved that way 
What causes somebody to want to lift up their fam- uproot their family, move it to a different country? Maybe into a place where they hate the fact that the name Jesus Christ is abundant in the world. And they do everything they can to stop it. What causes somebody to want to say, I want to go win them people? Compassion. We'll go if we love. We'll live by faith if we love them. But how do we do that? We've got to keep ourselves in the love of God. Don't let the flesh pull you out. Don't let the world get you so jaded and apathetic that you get out of the love of God. Stay in it. Because if you stay in it, you'll have compassion. I've got to remove my wants, my desires. Get the me out of it. Get more of Christ in me. Get Jordan out. Put Jesus in. I, I live, but not I. Christ lives in me. Remove me from my Christianity, and that's the best Christian I can be. I've just got to be obedient to do what He tells me. It's hard work to be obedient because the flesh is saying no while the Spirit's saying yes. That's our struggle. But we endure that struggle and we accept it because we know if we embrace that pain, somebody else may have their pain taken away. I want to be like Him because only being like Him is what's going to win the world. And it's going to win the ones that I want to end their suffering. So I'll, I'll embrace the battle with myself. I'll embrace other people. shooting. Dark. I'll em- endure the traps and the snares of the devil. I'll take all of that. And yeah, it's going to hurt. There are going to be days that I fail. I may step in the trap. But I endure it all and get it made right and stay in the love of God because I want somebody else to hear. It's not about me. It's about Him and going to them. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.